good art can be an alloy. You know, you can take two things and melt it together and hammer it into shape. That's artist, illustrator, creative director, Funko, Formulaiker, Reese O'Brien. And on this special episode, well, special in that it's our 50th episode. We've been doing this for over a year now. We have a great conversation with Reese O'Brien. And Reese is somebody who has been around long enough to realize that what he wanted to do was not what he started out to do. What he does now is what he truly loves. And to get there, that journey, that realization of loving what you do and being fulfilled as an artist is the goal. And so we're going to get right into it because I don't want to waste too much time. Reese has some great advice, some great guidance, a great story. And he really explains his journey and the pitfalls and the hurdles along the way to help really everybody at every period in their career. Here we go with Reese O'Brien. So a creative director at Funko, it's a bit of keeping your eyes on everything. Like I like to think of it as like kind of the conductor of the orchestra. So for every project that myself and the team under me is handling, I'm kind of in charge of making sure that everything goes smoothly, approvals are getting made, license or feedback is getting taken care of. So it's a lot of moving parts and I'm kind of standing there making sure everything's moving in a nice fluid fashion, if that makes sense. And that's different than being an art director. Is it more managerial, more creative? It's actually a little bit of both. Whereas I imagine the title of art director tends to be like almost strictly visual in a lot of companies that I've dealt with in the past or worked with in the past. Whereas a creative director, you're still dealing with everything visually and you're still making sure that the art looks good and everything's going well. But you're also kind of, you're managing people's schedules. You're making sure everybody's, you know, staying motivated. There's a lot of like people management sometimes, which was a factor I didn't expect in the job, but I actually really enjoy and honestly feel like I've got a knack for it. So keeping people motivated, keeping people excited about the projects, keeping a level of pride in being a part of the team is kind of important in that aspect. So the people management side of it wasn't something I expected. When I went into this field, I thought, oh, I have an eye for things. I'll make sure everything looks pretty <laughs> so it gets on the shelves and people dig it. But honestly, the, the people management side, it, it came as a surprise to me, but I actually really enjoy it. That's interesting you say that because, I mean, I've talked to some other creative directors in the past and anybody that's, you know, kind of starting out as a designer, there's definite career paths. I'm a rock star designer. I'm a <laughs> rock star creative director. And then what's a rock star creative director mean? It's like, well, my thumbprint is on everything. And then the ones that seem to be the happiest are like what you just said, where it's, no, I'm, I'm just helping facilitate. I mean, it's a little more than that. The projects still feel like my babies in a way, but it it's more like now the babies are being raised by a family, if that makes sense. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like in my younger days, in the beginning of my career, I was very like, this is my project. No one else can touch it. I am going to make all the decisions and all, you know, and I was very like that. And over the years, I learned that's kind of an unhealthy <laughs> attitude to have. <laughs> The more I started to kind of embrace the kind of more family picnic aspect mm. of designing a product, um, especially a collectible, the more I started to see better successes. The product would come out better because you would have all this influence from other eyes and other imaginations and other voices that I didn't really get before. So once I was, you know, kind of in just an emotional headspace, like I grew up enough to be able to be like, okay, yeah, let's do this as a group thing. The product just started getting better and better and better. And now I can't even imagine working on something, you know, siloed away like Gollum in his cave and, and my projects, my precious, you know, I learned that that wasn't really a healthy way of doing things in the way that I've embraced is now kind of my bread and butter. That's where I'm happiest. That's good to hear because, I mean, I yeah. think so many designers, myself included, we all get into that point where we're like, no, this is mine. Yeah. Oh, no. Go it's so away. precious to me. This is my voice. 
Yes. <laughs> nobody, nobody cares about my voice. You know, like they care about beautiful product on their shelves, man. Let's get into that because, I mean, okay. we're going to come back to where, you know, kind of your origin story to steal okay. that and overdo that. But how would you describe Funko Pop to somebody who doesn't really know it? Do you call it a toy company? Do you call it a collectible mm. company? Mm. I mean, that's a big difference. There is a big difference, but there's a lot of overlap, too. It's really kind of difficult. And this is going to go back to how collectibles are viewed in the United States because it's a cultural thing. You know, since the 60s and 70s, toy collecting overseas in like Japan, for example, was a more widely accepted thing with adults and everything. So the word toy, it wasn't a dirty word. Over here in the States, we have this, well, at least when I was growing up, we had this kind of you turn a certain age, you put those kind of things away, you don't play with toys, you don't have toys, you don't collect toys. Right, yeah, puberty means cars, right. y- the yeah. opposite sex, yeah. exactly. jobs, yeah. things. Girls, guitars, skateboards, you got to man up, right? And that was kind of the old-fashioned attitude. And then there was a generation, my generation, I think, was the first generation to kind of rebel against that despite my dad's best efforts <laughs> um, <laughs> to squash it. So I was a closet toy collector for a while. You should have seen under my bed when I was 17. It was, <laughs> there was like 89 Batman, you know, oh, action geez. figures and stuff. <laughs> but anyway, so as that attitude changed here in the States throughout the 90s, and especially it really blew up in the 2000s, people started toy collecting. Now, there was still a faction of people that were like, no, no, they're not toys. Because they still have that ingrained in them that toys is a bad word. I paid for this with a credit card. I'm not a child. It's a collectible made by an artist. Well, you know what, man? Mm. They were always collectibles made by artists. (laughs) You know? We just played. Their intent was different back in the day. You know, back then you played with them in the dirt and destroyed them. Now you can preserve these things a little better and you can enjoy them aesthetically without having to go into your shame closet. You know? Uh, So I I think that's kind of what it is now. So... Where are we now? Well, we're still in this kind of miasma of, is it a toy? Is it a collectible? Even at Funko itself, there behind the scenes, there's still some people that are like, well, no, we're not a toy company. We're a collectible company. But at the end of the day, they are these aesthetically pleasing plastic objects designed for no other purpose but to remind you of the things you love, okay, and to spark your imagination. And if that's not toys, I don't know what is. Wow. Okay. That's a very interesting way of looking at this because that's the hard part. I think we're talking from the Academy of Art University. You know, Mm -hmm. you and I are are closer in age. And then there's people who are designing. So it's like, well, I want a job designing toys. That's not a job. And then you meet somebody that designs toys. You're like, that is an insane job. It's a job. I don't know how you can pull that off because you have to make something people will buy, which is probably the hardest thing ever. I mean, that's all we're doing. Well, yeah. I mean, not only is it you got to get somebody to buy it, but it's definitely something nobody needs. Or so or so (laughs) people will tell you, right? Right. Like, I have a different philosophy on that. But it's okay. You need food. You need shelter. You need transportation. You need child care. Those are needs, like, if we're really talking about it. But here's this cute little big-headed, black-eyed character from your favorite TV show. We've got to get you in a headspace where you need that on your desk in your office or in your shelf at home. Yeah. To be the obnoxious person in quote fight club in the hunter gatherer (laughs) sense of the word. Right. We need this. Is it duvet? No, it's just a blanket. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) But see, but then, then we get into the deeper psychology behind what human needs are. And there is a need for, a mental break or just a small reminder of something that you love. Like there is a need for that. And people have been doing it since the dawn of time. I mean, they've dug up, you know, bronze age and iron age fetishes of little characters and animals and things like that. That's, you know, some hairy guy in a cave, you know, shaped a stone into. Yeah. I'd say what page five of every art history book is the (laughs) Venus of Villendorf. The Venus of Villendorf. Why why am I looking at this thing? It's a toy. (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's kind of is, you know, I was actually recently reading a great book on the history of toys and the author and the books from the 70s, but it's still brilliant information. And the author went into some of the earliest toys that were ever excavated from, you know, like the Sumerians. And they were like literally making little toy soldiers and little toy animals and little toy oh. farmers back then. Oh, man. So this is an innate need. 
that a lot of people don't quite recognize. It's almost a, and this is going to sound weird, but it's almost like a way to get a little taste of a godlike feeling over something smaller that you can kind of control and hope for and put your dreams into. And that's what children are doing when they play. They're developing their abilities to cope and, you know, work with other children and stuff. But adults need that too. We need that little sense of control and we need that little... I mean, that's why a lot of collectors, they curate their collection so meticulously. And that's a nice feeling of control that you can have. And it, and it, it produces serotonin in your brain and you feel better when you look at your beautiful collection just sitting up there pristine and perfect. So when people, you know, I, I joke and, and I say, well, we're trying to sell you something you don't need. But honestly, to my personal belief, you do need these things. And when you explain it that way, it makes so much more sense. And the whole collectibles industry is very strange. I grew up in the collectibles industry and a lot of artists kind of come in and out of that where it's like you are designing for disposable income. So Correct. You know, how are we going to make this disposable income? product interesting right. right um so when you're designing for this and let's get into a little bit of the design stuff funko pops are very simple to the untrained eye and then anybody that takes you know art 101 goes simple is going to make your life difficult yes how do you design something that is exceedingly simple but not well first of all yeah you touched on simple design is vastly more difficult than intricate design because you, as you know and many designers know the slightest pixel nudge the wrong direction can throw the whole thing off right so in the collectible world as we develop pops pops started out very simple they've gotten more complex and they're sculpt in detail over the years but when we found a base that was so simple and so clean and so aesthetically pleasing that it, it worked as a beautiful template that we could like take other characters from TV shows, movies, cartoons, and everything and, and kind of translate onto that. So we kind of lucked out with the pop design all those years ago. <laughs> like they, you know, our designers, uh, Sean Wilkinson and, and Rob Schwartz, like they were the, the <laughs> there are grandfathers in this and they came up with it and they really just, nailed it early on and we've been kind of just riding on that ever since now i do have a philosophy that the simpler a face is or the simpler uh, a body is the easier uh, a collector or anyone viewing it for that matter can see themselves in it because that's another psychological thing that we like to do there's a book called understanding comics by scott mcleod it's a graphic novel and it's brilliant. I suggest everyone go read it. Every designer should go read it, whether you like comics or not. In that, he has a wonderful breakdown about the simplicity of faces and the psychological need or ease, I should say, of people being able to see themselves in simpler faces. Everybody loves Snoopy. You know why? He's simple. <laughs> Everybody fell in love with early Mickey Mouse. You know why? He's simple. Go look at Steamboat Willie. He's a series of circles and black eyes that you can see yourself in. That's what a pop is. Hello Kitty, Miffy. There's all these designs that people can see themselves in. And that's exactly what a pop is. Wow. Okay. That makes sense from the artsy fartsy smart side sure, of it. Sure. Sure. Uh, which it, it does. And, you know, for understanding that, I think a lot of people, you know, when they're collecting it, may not even realize that that's what's gone into it. Do you have, you kind of touched on, you know, we've come up this, with this idea of how it looks. Are there specific rules? Oh, sure. To designing a giant headed, small bodied entity? There are basic rules. There's, you know, the eyes are around 10 millimeters and they're a certain distance apart. And the head has that kind of old school TV screen shape. The body's roughly a 50 50 head to body ratio. So there are certain rules there. Despite how detailed certain pops have gotten over the years, we do simplify, we cutify. You know, there are certain things there. But a lot of these rules, they can't be set in stone because you need, what's the philosophy? Don't be a rock in a river, be a reed in the river. So you need to be able to flow with your translation. So if you have an extremely difficult character, because not everything's got a head with two eyes, like sometimes it's a dragon or sometimes it's a, a stormtrooper or, you know, you need to 
still find that translation while working within those rules. But if the rules are too constricting, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot design wise. That brings up another question. I mean, originally, you know, if anybody's seen the documentary on Funko or, or mm-hmm. if you collect Funko or see it without getting too promo y of Funko, you know, it's working with existing IP, which is, you know, another buzzword that, that we're, we talk about all the time, but it's a character we already know. And, you know, Star Wars has its rules. And for baseball and sports, they have their rules. How does that work? Or what advice can you give to your designers or the problems you guys are solving when you're working with something that has a very specific look and feel? And now I have to translate it into this entirely different look and feel. I think the biggest lesson there is, and I've dealt with it a lot, especially in Star Wars, they want their characters to look like their characters, you know? So you need to find that happy medium. You need to learn the art of graceful collaboration. You know what I mean? Because if they stick too hard to their rules and you stick too hard to your rules, you're never going to come out with a product that is pleasing to the collector. So collaboration is really important. You need to listen and hear what they're saying, hear their suggestions. You need to present your suggestions in a palatable way. I mean, this is surgery with a scalpel. It's not, you know, you're not using a chainsaw. You need to be graceful and open-minded. And if you can build a good relationship, like I think our strongest asset at Funko or our greatest strength at Funko is the strength of our relationships with our licensors. You build relationships, you build trust over time. I mean, there are certain licenses that I work with so easily now that they trust us. I mean, we've never steered them wrong in the past. They kind of understand what we're trying to do. And after a while, it's like a band that practices together over and over again. You're going to start sounding great. And so that's where I think a lot of our pops, especially nowadays, some of our pops just blow my mind when I look at them. Like, you'd think I'm sick of them, but sometimes I'll sneak into like the little pop section or actually the large pop section at Target and I'll just look at them and I'll just be like, God, that one came out great. (laughs) And the reason I can still do that is because we built such a trusting relationship with our licensors that, you know, we're singing beautifully together. Well, give me an example of one of those pops where you go, wow. How did we pull that off? <laughs> what was one of the licensed products where you're like, oh my gosh, that, huh, that thing worked. Well, like, for example, I work on Star Wars. That's one of the licenses that I oversee. And I've, over the years, built a really great relationship with our folks over at Lucasfilm. And, like, to the point where I consider some of them friends now, you know? like, And because of that, like, when we were working on Mandalorian Season 1 and Season 2 Pops... Okay, so this is going to be a major launch. This is this is, this is good for like, everybody. This yeah, is worldwide this is at this point. Every all the collectors want it. Lucasfilm wants us to knock it out of the park. We want to knock it out of the park. We had to move quickly because it's a television show. That the the season only lasts so long, so you got to hit people while they're excited about it. So all of these things had to fall into place beautifully, right? And because we had such a good relationship with Lucasfilm at the time, and both parties knew that we needed to move quickly, that we were just really open-minded with each other with suggestions and things like that. So we did a great job on the season one stuff, but the season two stuff was like, in my personal opinion, pitch perfect. Like note for note, pitch perfect. There's one movie moment. Movie moments are our larger pop scenes, I guess Mm -hmm. you'd call them. There's one movie moment where Grogu, the little... Baby Yoda. Baby Yoda, who's not Baby Yoda. He's not Baby Yoda. (laughs) Is looking at the canister full of those frog lady eggs. Sure, sure. And he's kind of reaching for it. I was in Target this past weekend, and I saw it there. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I saw it while it was being developed. I saw it, but seeing it on the store shelves. And it is just absolutely beautiful. The the expression on little Grogu's face, the way that longing look, like that's what our, our sculptor put into his face, you know? The, the way we handled how the eggs look inside of like the clear canister so they actually look like they're floating in there. They're not. It's a magic trick. It's all sculpting and it's all, you know, how you mold plastic and everything. In the way like the color callout artist made the metal look kind of aged and everything and even the grass and, and the ground beneath both of the, It's just 
It's gorgeous. Like I picked it up and I was like, I'm going to buy this. And I was like, wait, you have a sample of this at home. <laughs> but I, well, I, you need one in a box. I know. Remember, right? You need like, the one was, in the box. I know. And so that's like kind of an example of how well a strong relationship can work for both parties that even I was like, oh my God, I got to have this, you know? And I remember working on that specific piece and it going smooth. <laughs> like it just, that, that whole process went super smooth and we ended up with a gorgeous piece of collectibles. So that brings up the question, which I think we know the answer. Are Funkos fun? Oh my God. <laughs> They're a blast. I mean, and, and I know people probably expect me to say that and they're like, oh, he's got to say that. Dude, they're fun. We get excited. We like, we're high-fiving in the office when we really nail it. I mean, if they're cute to the collectors, they're cute to us too, you know? So yeah, we get pretty excited about them. But then I have to ask you too, when it goes bad, what goes bad? Ooh. What's a hard, what's a, what are these design, not bad, because nothing's bad. What are some of those design hurdles? Less, 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 less successful. Less successful. Let's call uh, it that. Didn't quite hit the market, but something that, you know, a design mm. hurdle, because again, we're talking about working with existing IP. Yeah. Uh, on this particular product, your existing IP, and you're dealing with another kind of an existing IP. When it doesn't work, mm. what are the hurdles you're running into? I'll have to dance around this answer sure. carefully yes you know i won't name names or anything but there have been moments like you know where i don't know if i could point out like any failures but there are occasions where i go oh god that's a shame that had to be that way and a lot of that goes back to maybe there wasn't the most trust in the relationship and i'm just saying maybe you know a lot of times you know licensing can be really difficult a lot of licensors you know they can have differing levels of teamwork as well sometimes like a, you know i gave you good examples like lucasfilm and marvel who work with us wonderfully and we just have a great time warner brothers is wonderful but there are other licensors that oh god i don't know how to say that well here's a more intelligent student question okay if i'm working with a licensor they're not all going to be, go for it, man. You rock. We trust you. Yeah, yeah no, they're not going to be. <laughs> it, what, they're how going, do you deal with it? Well, th there are those occasions, and they're rare. Don't get me wrong. Like, they're actually rare. I'm making it sound like it happens all the time. But I, it has happened in the past where we've had a license where the licensor, like, their license is a little too precious to them, and they don't fully understand the off-modelness or the translation, and they push really hard back to on model and we're like no 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 but pop isn't on model pop is a translation like that has happened in the past and there's a lot of tug of war and a lot of times it's a pretty even tug of war that no one fully wins and so i'm not saying it's happened a lot but it has happened and there does come a time and i hate to say it where you kind of go well listen man we're running out of time like if we want to get this on shelves in time okay dude you win and you have to know, what's that Kenny Rogers song? You got to know when to hold them and hold know them, when, know to, when fold to fold them. them. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, all right, dude, I fold. To throw somebody else under the bus. For a designer who's yeah. you know, facing that too, right. you know, what are some of the creative direction and some of the guidance you're giving designers who may be coming in? Because I can't imagine that you, know, you look at somebody's portfolio or somebody just goes, boom, I know how to design Funko. There has to be some, I'm assuming there's some brain adjustment that comes oh, yeah. in what is some of that guidance you're giving somebody when it is like you said off model or an interpretation what advice you're giving to designers on that end well a lot of it is nuance i i look at a lot of like the funko pop fan art and stuff that's out there on instagram and things like that and a lot of it's great i love seeing it like it's one of my favorite things but also the art director in me goes yeah those fingers aren't fat enough or those you know there's little nuances that you might think you've got it all buttoned up and dialed in. I certainly did. I came into Funko like, woohoo, I can do this. And then, boy, did I get humbled quickly. What, what humbled you? I guess that I didn't understand the subtle nuances that make a pop a pop, especially an appealing pop. You do have to, you kind of got to take your knocks and you have to train your brain. When I'm talking subtle, man, I mean subtle. There's these tiny little things that we keep our eyes out for that I think a lot of collectors don't realize we're keeping our eyes out for. Like, 
when a figure crouches down, we have to imagine how tall are they when they do straighten their legs because you, you don't want them to look too tall. When we have to bend arms or get like an interesting pose, we still have to understand how long their forearms are and their biceps are. Like there's these little kind of things. Or sometimes if they need a subtle expression, we don't do a lot of expression in pop, but if it requires it because of the character or whatever, like just how high do you want to raise that one eyebrow? Like it's those kind of things that you... I came into Funko going, yeah, I got this. And I went, oh, no, I don't have this. And it, and it took some time to learn, you know. But luckily, our creative department is so, you know, like we all have each other's backs. And you can kind of lean on the expertise of the people who came before you. Uh, so then, you know, I mean, obviously, toys are an art form. Uh, they are. Because there's so many creatives involved in it. Mm -hmm. But how do you describe toys as an art form to someone? <laughs> How do you go, this really is an art form. Let me tell you why. Well, I think that goes back to, well, why should I have to explain to people that it's an art form? <laughs> it, it, should, it, it should be obvious because it's obvious to me. But again, because, you know, especially in the culture here in America for the longest time with toys being kind of a bad word, you do have to kind of explain to people that the amount of creativity that can go into a collectible in the amount of time and the amount of care and the amount of back and forth and the amount of collaboration and blood, sweat, and tears that can go into a collectible is comparable to the same amount of blood, sweat, and tears and time and energy and knowledge and creativity that can go into a painting that's hung in a gallery. The effort and the source, the wellspring from which it flows, a, a human imagination, is exactly the same. It's just the connotation is different to a lot of people. So really, you just kind of got to break through their preconceived notions of what a toy is. And so as long as you can kind of explain that, they may or may not agree with you after you're, sure. you know, after I'm rant, done ranting and they're just like, <laughs> sir, I'm just serving you coffee. Like, please, please go away, you know. Yeah, Stop they, hitting my child with the plastic knob <laughs> thing, buddy. Come just, on. He already bought it, okay? I'm just asking if you want paper or plastic, sir. <laughs> and I'm ranting in a grocery store. But that's kind of my philosophy behind it. Designing a toy or a collectible is no different than the amount of energy and creativity that goes into creating fine art. It's just an application. I feel the same way about illustration. I feel the same way about comic book art. I feel the same way. It all comes from the same wellspring. It's just where you choose to deliver it so then at some point i'm sure you decided to come to funko but before that i'm guessing you were doing other creative work i'm assuming Correct. right yeah what were you doing before you went down this rabbit hole was it always toys or was it something totally different well, i always i always wanted it to be toys i wanted to be a toy designer since i was you know five years old and i actually talk about it in the funko documentary there's a, a side story there I always wanted to be in the toy industry, but I just never knew how to break into it. But so I went into graphic design and for a long time, I was kind of a traditional graphic designer, a lot of logos, a lot of, you know, people's business cards and a lot of flyers. And, yeah. A lot of flyers, but menus and brand identity packages and things like that. I, and then I found my way. I always wanted to be more of an illustrator. I tried to break into the comic business in the nineties, but I didn't make it, <laughs> um, you know, but I ended up working, using more illustration because I became a t-shirt designer. So I was doing like graphic tees for kids. So I was drawing lots of dinosaurs and UFOs and monster trucks and, you know, skateboards. Still, still, pretty, still pretty cool stuff. Much more fun than like somebody's like, you know, bakery logo or whatever, <laughs> you know. So I, I got into that and then there was a t-shirt company I was working for several years, like ages ago at this point that did a thing that was called GWP, Gift with Purchase. And what, what that is, is you could buy this kid's t-shirt and it would have like a little kind of cheap toy attached to it. Well, at the place I was working, nobody wanted to be in charge of the toys. And I was like, oh, I'll do it. And they're like, oh, okay, this idiot over sucker. here wants it. Yeah, sucker, you want to be in charge <laughs> of the toys? Go right ahead. So I basically built a toy design department with one employee, me, in it. And I designed all these like little cheap, crappy toys that went, came with a free t-shirt. And then eventually that caught the attention of our art director. And this is going to get convoluted named Mike Becker. And he said, Hey man, I like your style. He was like, I've been thinking about doing a side thing of collectibles. 
want to join me on this adventure? And I was like, sure thing. So I joined Becker on this adventure. Well, Becker was the original founder of, of Funko, but he had sold it ages ago to Mariotti, Brian Mariotti, our fearless leader. So Becker and I, for a couple of years, did this kind of side thing. And um, it was a lot of fun. It was a blast. I learned a lot from Mike Becker. That guy's been in the industry for a long time. So I, I kind of got a nice crash course on, you know, how to deal with things, licensing and things like that. And then uh, eventually that company caught the attention of Funko and got bought by Funko. And I came along with the purchase. <laughs> so that's how I ended up working at Funko. Now me and Mike are back with Funko. And, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's kind of crazy, man. It, you know, there's not a lot of people in this industry. So you all end up working together <laughs> on and off. You know what I mean? So I'm going to so go do my thing for a while, but I'll be back. But I'll be back. Like whether I know that right now or not, <laughs> I'll be back, you know? So yeah, that's kind of how that happened. How do you you approach then designing toys. I mean, outside of the Funko Pop, just designing action figures and you, know, you had Tiny Ghost. When somebody sits down and, and goes, I want to design a toy and I want to design an action figure, it sounds like the most awesome thing ever. It sounds like I'm going to get to, be. you know, it's like, I'm, you know, this is going to be the ultimate kit bashing experience and they're going to pay me for it. Easy. I'm sure it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not. <laughs> but how, how do you decide... And what are those steps you took into making a toy? Well, first of all, a couple of misconceptions I always want to kind of clear people up. on. We're not sitting around kit bashing things. You know, you see the documentaries about like early Kenner and how they kit bashed the Star Wars figures together from the Fisher Price. I think a lot of people on Instagram or whatever, I think they think we're like, kit bashing pops together to design them and we're not we're graphic designers this is all being done in like adobe illustrator and photoshop on our ipads and you know come on you're making you're, it's not supposed to be that difficult man it, it really it i'm like, supposed to walk into a pick and say or a big lots or some yeah. some garage sale and just go hucklu 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 done no Can I get my money nope that's not how it works <laughs> it's not how it works at all so first of all we're not doing that we are sitting down and we, we are utilizing things that we learned in our careers and in our schooling in graphic design to create these things. And then the other uh, thing is that I personally, I mean, other than when I like get an assignment, like, okay, you need to make, you need to translate this character into a pop. But when I'm trying to come up with something completely new, I don't always sit down and go, okay, I'm going to create a new collectible now and then do it. I tend to just free form, draw whatever weird stuff is in my head and 80, 90% of it isn't even pitchable, but that last 20, 10% that is gets a shot. So really it's just a matter of like, instead of throwing single darts, trying to get a bullseye, I get two handfuls of darts and I chuck them all at once and I see what sticks. So a lot of times the design process isn't so much intentional as it is cathartic. And I'm just getting what's bubbling up naturally inside my cranium out onto a piece of paper. Well, not so much paper anymore. And onto my iPad and into an email to my boss. <laughs> so you're so you're monetizing your therapy then. Kind of. Because <laughs> hey man, like seriously, creativity is therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Creativity is cathartic. That's why people just paint for fun at home. But I think a lot of the reasons we go into the business that we go into is because we have no choice to. Our brains are making us do this. There's a need to express this and get this out of us. So we go into the business. So my job is very cathartic. And I don't mean cathartic in the sense of like, oh man, I got some like ghosts that are haunting me to this day that I got to get out of my psyche. I just mean sometimes silliness needs to come out or a goofy pun that makes you laugh needs to be visualized, you know? So it is cathartic in that sense. And and it is very therapeutic because let me tell you, man, when I do land something and it gets greenlit and then it actually gets made and then it ends up on shelves and collectors love it and they buy it. Oh, dude, there's no hour on the couch is ever going to equal that. Oh, man. <laughs> so then what can you say where your best ideas come from? Is it just the ether? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. The best ideas I come up with while I'm walking the dog or I'm taking a shower, you know, or somebody makes a silly joke, like a bad pun at lunchtime while we're, you know, at Burger King. And I'm just like, wow, that's hilarious. And then I got to go home and draw it. Yeah. They come out of nowhere sometimes. I've noticed like, cause in my early career, I would sit down and be like, okay, 
I'm going to create a collectible series of blind box, blah, blah, blah. And then you sit there and you come up with the stupidest stuff you've ever come up with, or you come up with something you've already seen. You're ripping somebody else off, which is a dangerous thing. So now I've learned to just like, I'm just going to goof off and draw what makes me happy and makes me laugh and I'll pitch it. And if something gets greenlit, it gets greenlit. Great. But otherwise, you know, I'm just going to wing this guitar solo. I'm not going to sit there and think about the notes. How do you then do you describe yourself as an artist? Because I know that's the the question that <laughs> it, it hurts me to say, even ask that question. It's such a lame question, but it's such an important question when somebody's going through art school. Right. Either if they're going right out of high school or they're coming back later and going, I'm going to go to art school. It's like, I'm an artist. What does that mean? I don't know. I'm a bit more practical and pragmatic about what is an artist and what isn't an artist. Like, I'm an artist because my mortgage gets paid because of the art I create. I'm sorry, like at the end of the day, that's why I'm an artist, you know, but at it, at its truest, like most basic lizard brain form, I'm an artist because I'm able to get what's in my head out of my head in a format that people can see and appreciate or not appreciate. How did you get to that point where that was comfortable for you? I stopped caring what people think. <laughs> it's really like, that's how I got comfortable with it. I used to overthink what I allowed out of my brain and what I held in there. I used to worry about, I would, you know, sit there drawing and go, oh my God, what's so-and-so going to think of this? Or what, what are the masses going to think of this? After a while, I stopped caring what they think and not in a callous, like, you know, look at me kind of way. I had to stop caring or else the real good stuff wasn't going to come out. All I need to please is me in that first initial moment. Then I can show it to my boss, and if he likes it, we can tweak it, and we can adjust and things like that, and I'm fine with it. But first and foremost, it's got to come out of my head and make me either laugh or get the willies or you know whatever my goal was. I am my first audience. That's awesome. That's a great way of looking at it. Was there like a turning point for you creatively? Was there something a mentor said or some good advice or sometimes it's always bad advice that just went, <laughs> aha, I hate that person. I love that person. <laughs> it was a little bit of both. I would see other artists in this field, like I would watch online and I would see where they would steer wrong and I'd go, ooh, I don't want to do that. You know, and it really scared me because I, I knew I was susceptible to that. But the best piece of advice I ever got was from our um, vice president of creative, Ben Butcher, who's been an incredible mentor to me. He told me one time, I, had, I can't remember what I had drawn. I had drawn something so weird that like my boss and, and some of the higher ups were like laughed me out of the office. And I remember being kind of bummed about it. Like this was several years ago and, and I was like kind of down about it. And he told me, he, he was like kind of talking me off the ledge, but he said, man, he goes, don't even sweat it. He goes, you swung for the fence, right? And I was like, well, yeah. And he goes, that's okay. He was like, what you don't want to do is you don't want to create something that everyone likes. And I said, well, why not? Isn't that the business we're in? And he's like, no, no. He said, because if you create something that everyone likes, you have created something so safe, so non-threatening, that there's just no longer anything that special about it. And I went, wow, actually, that's a really good point. So I stopped trying to be safe after that. Slowly, I started kind of, okay, well, maybe I'll, you know, and then I stopped worrying about the people laughing me out of the office or going, yeah, I don't get it or whatever. Because if I get that reaction, that means I swung for the fence. If I get a room full of people going, oh my God, we love it. It's absolutely perfect. I go, uh, oh, something's up. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I could have pushed this one a little further. <laughs> oh, I just put yeah. hot sauce on tacos. I, I guess I'm brilliant. Yeah. But not exact, that brilliant. But not that brilliant. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So I learned to almost enjoy a certain percentage of people that just don't get it. Because if, if I got a certain percentage of people that don't get it, I got a certain percentage of people that love it. They get it. And it, it's dear to them. And I'll take that over everyone liking it any day. You know? Also, another thing that really got me is I was reading a book, a different book on the history of toys. And they were talking about 
Toy Fair in the 80s, and they were talking about the biggest hits of the 80s, Cabbage Patch Kids, Rubik's Cubes, that kind of, you know, like really bizarre stuff like that that just like became fads, you know. And they said all of that stuff was like basically laughed out of Toy Fair. Like everyone at Toy Fair that year in 1983 or whatever was like, that doll is ugly. Get that thing out of here. Um, what do I want a little fat kid for? Come yeah, on. God, they, you know, but all those things became massive, massive hits. And so that was another lesson. Or, and it all happened around, I was reading that book around the same time Butcher told me that advice. And I went, yep, that's it. If you don't keep your edge, then your designs are not going to have an edge. That's interesting you bring that up because you're talking about doing a lot of reading and doing a lot of mm-hmm. research. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people, when they're in school, we get obsessed with, even out of school, trying to get a career or even, oh, you, know, yeah. you get obsessed with, I can do this amazing thing. I can work in this program better than anybody. I can draw circles, perfect, one shot. I've got a whole Instagram channel to my circle drawing. But how does somebody find good influence, find mm. something that helps them to break out? Well, first of all, you have to find humility. I had to do that in a major way. And you have to be humble enough to look at those amazing skills that you've developed and realize that nobody cares. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nobody cares that you can draw a perfect circle or that you're a master at this or that all they care about in the end is can you take the ingredients your skills your knowledge your creativity can you take all those ingredients and make a delicious soup with it because if you can't because if all you got is the greatest salt in the world that's all you have is salt but you need it. You need all of it. I, this is the weirdest analogy I've ever come up with, and I apologize. No, but, no, no. I'm digging it. Yo, come on. But, yeah, but you I, see I, what I, I'm saying, I it. right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, so. I've got $700 knives I bought in Japan <laughs> that are still in the box because they scared yeah. the crap out of me. Yeah, there you go. But that's, that's what I'm saying. You've got to find that humility and realize nobody's going to be impressed. Let's use a music uh, analogy, okay? So I, I play guitar. Not well, but I do it, and it's one of my favorite things to do. So I watch a lot of guitar players on, you know, TikTok and Instagram and stuff. And there's guys out there that can go, willy, 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 and they can do play the, most... play the same riff with six different styles in 30 yeah, seconds. It, it, but that's nothing compared to the four chords that Angus Young and ACDC <laughs> just destroys coliseums with. Right. How come all these songs sound the same? And why is my head bobbing up and down? And why am I happy? Exactly. So big deal dude you can go willy 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 all day long and you know all the arpeggios and you can play them super fast and that's great but you're still working a part-time job at a sandwich restaurant you see what i'm saying while you know while while black sabbath invented a genre with bar chords so it's what you do with it with what you got and it's knowing to use what you got in the right amounts That's more important than, look what I can do. Look at all the amazing things I can do. Nobody cares. We're not impressed. What you're talking about is great and great advice. And, you know, the question for me, and I think for a lot of people who are now older artists and, you know, looking at second, third, fourth, hopefully fifth career, hey, I got to live for a while. I've got a mortgage. I, I, I got some skills. I better figure out something else to do as well. How did you develop your influences? Because a lot of time when we talk to people as they've gotten older, it's like, well, now I'm reading again, or now I'm (laughs) going to Japan, or now I'm looking at something, you know, watching documentaries at three o'clock in the morning is now actually useful and has has value to it. But how did you develop or start finding the influences that were good for you? A lot of people think all influence is good. First of all, it's not. There's a lot of bad influences out there. I ruined, wasted years of my life trying to draw just like Ralph Steadman or, (laughs) uh, you know, Robert Crumb or Mm. something like that. And after a while, I just became a guy that was really great at mimicking those artists. That's not going to get you a career. Influence, I've learned, is something more subtle and under the surface. There were times when I'd be working on an illustration for a t-shirt design or working on a toy design, you know, or or something like that. And I'd go, wow, I really like that. Well, why do I like that? And I'll go, oh, because you know what this has? This has a little flavor of 
Jack Kirby. You know, and you know what this has? This got a little Bill Watterson to it. This has got a little Charles Schultz in it. And those, when it comes out of you accidentally, because it's bubbling under the surface, it's starting to become part of your creative DNA. You're not s deliberately setting out to mimic something. That's when influence can be dangerous. So I've learned to just not actively cram influence into my head. I've learned to, I don't know what's the word, let it sink in naturally. Does that make okay. sense? Sure. Yeah. And then if it comes out of me later, it comes out of me later, like <laughs> in a drawing I'm doing or whatever. If it doesn't, it doesn't. That's well, fine. What was something that surprised you then? What was something you were like, holy cow, where did that come from? My personal illustration style is very pen and inky, even when I'm working in Procreate. And that's because of my history in comic books and cartooning and things like that. But over the last few years, I found myself doing this like really bizarre kind of scritchy shading. And I was like, what am I, why am I doing it? And I was loving it. Like I was loving while I was doing it. And then when the piece would be done, I'd be like, oh my God, I love how that looks. It's easy to do because it was fun to do. So I've been doing more and more of it and I've been incorporating it in my personal art more and more. And then one day I was like looking at a book with some Edward Gorey illustrations in it. And I went. <laughs> Oh, there's that shading style. <laughs> I want, you know, and, and, and I was looking at like Edward Gorey and I was looking at a lot of political cartoonists I used to really enjoy. And I was going, oh, that's where I got that. I was looking at Charles Adams cartoons from The New Yorker and, and I was going, oh, that's why I'm doing it. Even Charles Schultz would do that. Like he would just barely ink in Charlie Brown's black shorts and there would be these little streaks of, Bristol board shining through. Right, right, right. And I was doing that without realizing I was mimicking that, if that makes sense. And, and so that made me kind of go, oh, I see what I'm doing there. That's a, kind of an example of, oh, it got into my DNA and it came out of me unintentionally for positive effect. Yeah, no, I was going to say that. I mean, positively mimicking is, is great. That's... When it comes out of you organically. Yeah. How did you discover that that was something you wanted or something that was working for you? Did it take you a while as an artist oh, or yeah. was? Oh, yeah. yes. It took me a long time. I mean, I'm 48 years old and I honestly feel I didn't come into my own as a naturally flowing kind of cr uh, creative force. So that sounds arrogant, but un until just in the last, I don't know, four or five years, to be honest really? with you. Oh, yeah. yeah. I feel like everything has been kind of a, I have fought to get the art to look right up until I was like, you know, 40, 42. All of a sudden, I just started to relax about things and it just comes way more naturally and organically and I'm way happier with it and having way more success with it. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, the happy, I, I'm, I'm guessing, is the 99% of why success is coming. I think that's, so, yeah. Yeah, it, that's... It shows in your art when you are happy in the creative process it shows well then we have to ask that stereotypical question of what advice would you give to your younger self the 39 oh, year old what was coming around the corner when you were 39 and still <laughs> hating what you were doing <laughs> but um, seriously i mean when we're starting out you know let's not go too young because that we're, you know i'm over 42 so it's like I, I don't remember but you know you're out of college you've got your portfolio what advice does somebody really need to hear when they've got it tucked under their arm or, you know, the leg right. ready to go. Okay, listen here. I would say find your own voice. Don't mimic someone else's voice. Even in graphic design, I, I found myself doing that. I would get caught up in, like, these hot shot logo designers and, you know, and I would try and kind of mimic their style. The David Carson yeah. makeup that we've all yeah, We've done. all done it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I... I I would say find your own voice and don't care. Not, not in a cavalier way, you know, like, but don't sweat it if a lot of people don't get it. I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but it did. I'm going to put it on a t-shirt. There you um, go. <laughs> Cafepress.com. Hold yeah, on one second. Hold on. I'll be right back. <laughs> Copyright, trademark, freeze over. Right. Just, yeah, just don't care if, you know, enjoy the rejection letters. It means you're on the right path in a sense, as long as your voice is true. 
and you're getting rejections, your true voice will one day, I honestly believe, be seen by the right people. And the payoff is astronomical. And I don't mean just like your paycheck. I mean your, your emotional payoff, the creative satisfaction is astronomical. If you stay true to yourself and find your voice and stick to your guns, you'll be fine. Wow. Now that things are going awesome for you, what's next? Putting Funko aside, Funko will, will be there forever. You love it. But you I were talking it. about your personal art and just finding joy. Oh, oof, I hate saying that out loud. Finding joy. In, finding uh, joy. Living finding your joy. true self. Living your true self. Have you lived, <laughs> laughed, and loved today? Um, <laughs> but creatively, you know, because again, I'm over 40 and I got a kid. So these are things I have to think about more and more oh, when, sure. you know, my kid's using finger paints and he's not doing it the right way. Like I told him to do 500 times, buddy. Oh, let him uh, do it. Just let him go. But let what? Him go. I know. It's like, oh, I've that's a, right. You got to yeah. let him, let the kid do it. I got a five-year-old too. And I'm just like, yeah, sure. If that's, if you want to draw hands coming out of the side of the head, I don't care. Whatever, You've man. mixed all the colors together. That's a pretty sure shade thing. of blah. I love it. Go love for it, it, buddy. For Mommy's it, over there. She's wearing white. Run. Yeah. But like, so, <laughs> you know, for you now, how does that change where you're going forward creatively? Well, oddly enough, for the first time in my life, I have no idea where I want to go creatively. Oh, wow. And I'm not worried about where I'm going creatively. Oh, oh wow. Okay. I'm more just kind of digging like the ride. You know what I mean? It's like you're reading a really good book and it's like, I don't want this book to end. You know, I just kind of want to see how it unfolds. So right now, I mean, I'm in a good stable place career wise, I feel anyway. So as long as I kind of keep that going, my personal creativity can kind of go where it wants at this point. And and it's very liberating to now be able to be kind of unapologetic about how you let your creativity flow out of you and not care about the end result as much as I used to, if that makes sense. That makes a whole lot of sense. That scary Thing we want to, but it's scary because if we reach it, some people think, "Well, you're done now." No, no, no. It's not no. golden. It's not golden handcuffs. It's yeah. It's liberation. It is. No, it really is. It is very liberating to just yeah, kind of organically let it happen. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. So yeah, and, and that's kind of where I'm at now at this point in my life. Wow, that's that's awesome. That's a hard thing to segue out of because it's like, I don't want to kill that. Uh, I don't want to like, now tell me all oh, the bad on. stuff. Kill it, kill it. Let's do this. <laughs> Show us your portfolio so we can poo-poo all over it. Just your line work is terrible and it's sloppy and your color scheme looks like a blind person. Good job. Good job. Yeah, but you know what? It's my <laughs> sloppy line work and it's my color scheme and I don't give a damn. Well, it's very funny when we talk, you know, about students and, you know, speaking from an academy, there is a change that seems to have happened in Art education, I think, with creatives, too. I mean, you and I are about close enough in age where there was a pride from the generation before us and the pride that we had where you, critiques made you cry. Yeah. And it was like somebody, you know, at least one person per critique was going to cry and you were going to get your day yep. crying in, this, in the bathroom stall. I had it. I watched a couple of students of mine go oh, through yeah. it daily. But there seems to be that change in critique style or at least to me, is that true? Has the world of working artists and working creatives, has there been a mind shift that you're seeing where people are going, okay, let's critique this differently. Let's talk about this differently. I think there has in the sense that even when I was in school, I never really subscribed to the school of hard knocks. The hard truth is good for you. It toughens you up. The real world will toughen you up enough you know, like reaming someone in front of their peers is not necessary. I also think that, what is it? You get more flies with honey than vinegar. What's the saying? You know, so you're going to get more out of a motivated person than a person that's been beaten down. Like I've never agreed. I've had those teachers when I was in school that had to break you in order to rebuild you. Right. What a load of garbage man like yeah, it's not full metal jacket it's it's, yeah, um, it's man. painting well, yeah. 101 man yeah this is not the marine corps <laughs> like it's yeah it's figure drawing like relax okay 
I, I just never subscribed to that. I always kind of uh, railed against it. Even back then, I, I did not get along with a lot of my teachers because of that. And, and a lot of times I was like, oh, you're just frustrated because, you know, this is where you landed, homeboy. You know, but I, I feel like it has changed for the better in the sense that people have learned to, to critique in a way, or at least they should learn, to critique in a way that keeps the person they're critiquing inspired and motivated and there's a way to do that even if everything's wrong there's a way to to talk to a fellow human being without crushing their heart in your hand you know and i think that's probably a change for the better that is a tough one i think for a lot of older people or people that have been been around a long time you hear it a lot i just remember you know some critiques where it's like well it's not a completely bad but you know it's completely wrong uh, thanks, man. Or... Like, thank you? <laughs> I don't know. See, so then... I, I just never responded to that kind of feedback yeah. anyway. As soon as I had a teacher, I could tell they were trying to break me. I was like, oh, you want to make me cry? I'm going to make you cry. <laughs> you know, I was the combative student. <laughs> What's some good success tips then for students now? It can be, you know, you know, point at what they should be thinking about. We talked about, you know, having your portfolio, but as far as, you know, getting into the technical side, getting into the, you know, okay, there's the mindset, which is extremely important because that's going to be your life. But there is some skills. There are some hard and fast things that students need to start thinking about or should be thinking about. Correct. What, what are some of those? I think the, the two off the top of my head that kind of served me well as I worked my way up the ladder is, and unfortunately, I, I'm seeing less and less of this these days, and it, it, I find it worrying, is that I think it's important to know your history, especially in the world that you're, you know, the career that you're going into. So, like, if you want to break into the toy business... I would read every book about the history of toys you can get into. Like, no, you're not going to design lead soldiers from the 1920s, but you should learn about them. You should learn about the history of marbles. You should learn about people like Marvin Glass, who was a genius toy inventor in the 50s and 60s. You should know where your industry that you're going into came from. If you do that, you will see this much bigger picture. It's like, why play a video game in like, okay, you're like in a dungeon crawl video game that didn't come with a map. Why not have the map? <laughs> right? Right. Because if you can see the map of where it's been so far, you will have a better understanding of where it can possibly go. So research the trends over the years, look behind the scenes of why something was popular. Why did every kid buy Garbage Pail Kids? Every kid I knew bought Garbage Pail Kids. Why? Why? Yeah. I, I still don't why. know why. <laughs> oh, I do. I yeah. do. But because I studied it. So go back and like study these things and learn them and build an, an encyclopedic knowledge of the field you're going to be in. I think that's a really important thing. And unfortunately, I'm seeing it kind of less and less. A lot of applicants don't even get past the first interview because we can tell they don't have one iota about our industry. And we're like, it's not our job to teach that to them. You know what I mean? You do need to come in somewhat prepared. And history is a big part of that. And unfortunately, I don't think that gets taught a lot, even in schools. So that's my first bit of advice. My second bit of advice is to not be afraid to show us a messy portfolio. And in that, I mean, in school, when I was in school, anyway, I don't know how it is now, but they wanted that thing so pristine and your logos are perfect and, you know, all, uh, all that stuff. I don't care about that. I want to see your thought process. Where's your dusty, crappy notebook full of pencil sketches and overlays on tracing paper? That's what I want to see. I want to see how your brain works. It's interesting you mentioned that because through the years you do meet people that when I first got out of school, I thought they were being cynical and pretentious. They go, let me see your sketchbook. And then 20 years later, you know, when I see people I'm like, can I see your sketchbook? Show me your sketchbook. I, I, that's, that looks more cool. Well, it doesn't even just look more cool. That's the real you, man. That's like, we might as well just cut your head open and look directly at your brain. Cause that, you know what I mean? Like that's really you as a designer. 
when I landed the job at that t-shirt company ages ago, I came up with my beautiful portfolio and my lovely logos and my letterhead layout and my gorgeous kerning and all that garbage, and they were bored to tears. And then I got desperate. I went, oh my God, this is not going well. And luckily I had some sketchbooks in my backpack. And I said, well, here's some like character design and stuff that I kind of worked on. And all of a sudden, everybody, there was like three guys in there interviewing me. They lit up and they were like, ooh, you did this? You created this character? Oh, and they saw my thought process and they saw how silly I can get and how messy I can get. They saw the things that I tried but just weren't working or whatever. Like there were drawings in there that just had a big X on them because I was like, nope, that's not working. <laughs> but they loved seeing that. And that's what got me the job. And unfortunately, I see a lot of pristine portfolios and I'm like, yeah, great. I mean, I go to their websites, I go to their Behance pages and I take a look at these things and I just go, yeah, that's lovely. But how did you get to that point? I want to see the thought process. I want to see the mess. So do your research, know your history, like the back of your hand and show us a messy portfolio. And I'm just going, you know, how deep into the rabbit hole do we want to go? Let's go. Uh me through your day as a creative mm. director because again to me as an employee as somebody who was often a freelance most of my career portfolio under my arm happened to go impress a creative director then it's like what the hell do you do all day a lot of my days flow from one to the other because everything is project based so you're always kind of you know, you're like a parent. You start your day, and if your projects are your kids, you make sure they get up and they brush their teeth and they go potty and they put on clean clothes. And you make sure that they're all in the same condition they were when you put them to bed the night before, right? Like a lot of it's that. So usually my day starts out, mostly it's a lot of check-ins. Hey, where are we with that? Did I get an email back from the factory in China, whether or not we can use this special kind of plastic that's a little hard to find, you know, or whatever. Oh, you know, so-and-so on the concept team said they were going to try and work on some sketches, you know, let me see if I got those. Oh yeah, they, they are. They look good. You know, like that. It's a lot of that. Then there's the X factors that hit you on a daily basis. Sometimes it's the hey man, can we jump on a call real quick? We kind of got to discuss this problem we're having with the articulation on this figure at the factory level. Okay, yeah, let's jump on a call. Oh, hey, the licensure just finally released uh, these assets we've been waiting on for this TV show. We got to jump on these right now. Who's available? You know, it's a lot of that kind of thing. So it's a weird, there's a lot of calm, just checking on things. How's it going, you know? And then these moments of frenzied activity where we got to, quickly problem solve and come to a conclusion as fast as possible. And so you've got to be ready for both in my position. Like I said, you know, I used the analogy earlier where I'm kind of conducting the orchestra. Well, you know, your first chair violinist is sick with the flu and all the trombones are lost in transit and all they have are clarinets. And that guy over there has got one cymbal. And what are you going to do, man? Like, how are you going to make this sound good? Because it needs to sound good tomorrow. You know, so it's kind of like that. You've got to kind of got to figure those things out. So it's a lot of problem solving and parenting in a weird way. And that, that makes a lot of sense because that, that, that was to follow up is do you ever find that you have to jump in and get down the nuts and bolts of creating and drawing and sketching? Every and, now and then. Yeah, yeah, every now and then. Less so these days because I had the privilege of being able to build my own teams I personally feel like kind of cherry pick the best of the best. I mean, we've got amazing designers. Don't get me wrong, but I'm like, I really want that. Yeah. Bit. I'm like, I want, <laughs> I really want that designer and I really want that sculptor, you know? And because of that, I built a team that I can kind of rely on and they're pretty self-sufficient. So I can kind of like oversee it. The only time I really need to jump in on the nuts and bolts is when it's something a bit obscure that may be outside of the realm of their personal knowledge and maybe the research is a little difficult to come by but because i am a nerd that reads books about the histories of toys and things like that i do have a working knowledge of it and i can be like you know what guys i think i know what the licensor wants here bear with me i'll be back in an hour and i'll just throw on my headphones and put on some death metal and just like crank out some sketches and i'll be like here you go this is what I think they're doing. So there are those times when that does have to happen. You're not a lonely manager at this point. No, no, exactly. I'm a part of the team. Yeah. 
that's good to hear because I know a lot of creative directors and a lot of people on the producer side, you know, it, it, you yeah, know, right. They they get a little. They're like, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me, and I'm right. the bearer of bad news today. <laughs> well, yes, and but also I think people like that need to stop and go. But did you choose that for yourself? Right. Because like, I never wanted to be that kind of director. I always wanted to be down in the trenches, you know, like a good leader doesn't sit in the back of the army. They're at the front of the army with the main charge. So I never wanted to build that distance. And I think I've seen that a lot with other directors I've worked with, not at Funko, but in other companies, like there's this kind of distance, do what I say distance. I never really uh, liked that. And I just didn't think it was conducive to a, a healthy collaborative effort. So I deliberately chose to kind of be in the trenches and I like to be in the trenches because if they don't see you doing the hard work, they're not gonna be motivated to do the hard work. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I'm not gonna ask any more questions because there's too much to process. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. In an awesome way where it's just like, wow. And any other questions I ask you are just gonna be, we've covered them or they're just gonna be silly. Except I'm, no, I'm gonna ask you one question because I do okay. think it's important because I like asking people this. Take your time on it. What is the one piece of artwork that you can look at as your favorite that really helps you stay motivated? That I created or? No, not that you created. Just, you know, if there's something you just kind of, you know, if you're in a museum or you're scrolling past it or it flips on TV, you're just like, ooh, it's that thing. Wow. That's a tough one. Oh, one piece of artwork? It doesn't have to be one. I'll let you slide to a style or a, you know, no genres, but something where, you know, if you're walking by it or you happen to, it's flipping by in something, you're just like, ooh, mm, it gives you the chills every time. Wow. Okay. I don't mean to go genre on this, but I'll try and narrow it down. But I am a big fan. There's an artist named Charles Wysocki. Nobody's going to know who he is. He, he passed away in the 90s. I think it was late 90s. And he embraced an American folk art style of landscape that is almost like a, kind of a Grandma Moses simplicity. Um, Pulling it up and I'm going, yes, the first thing I thought of was right. Grandma Moses. Exactly. It's a very, you know, perspective goes out the window. A, a, a lot of formal training goes out the window when you're looking at folk art because that's the point of folk art is that it's made by untrained people, but it's made entirely out of love and, and a desire to just make it. And... So I do find myself, and this is where it gets a little genre-y, I do find myself flipping through American folk art books. And I say American because it is very specific because you'll see a lot of just like raw wood sculptures from the deep south, or you'll see these very rudimentary portraits that were done around the Philadelphia and Boston area in the 17 to 1800s. It's the- Baker, Amish. Exactly. None of these people have formal training. They didn't go to schools. They didn't have teachers crushing them in front of their peers. They didn't have nice portfolios, but they had an innate need to create. And they, they did it without permission and without apology. And that's why I love folk art. Now, Charles Wysocki specifically is probably one of my all-time favorite artists, especially with his landscapes, because he was a trained artist. But what he did was this beautiful, seamless, kind of pitch-perfect weaving of that untrained folk art style along with his traditional training. And what happened, and that's very hard to do, is to mix that without looking like you're ripping it off, you know? So he married those two things together into, into just what I feel is such a, like, a beautiful image. So when I look at his landscapes specifically, sometimes they'll just be of, like, one building. Like, he'll do the one building, there's a couple of small people, and everything's around turn of the century. You don't see cars. It's horse and buggy. It's that kind of thing. And, and honestly, it's the kind of thing he sold a million calendars to grandmas all over the United States back in the 80s. And so when people see I'm a fan of it, like, I always buy his puzzles, and I'll put his puzzles together and stuff. They just think I'm nuts. But for some reason, I look at those paintings based on a style of art that is built strictly out of the love of making it and it's tempered with his professional training and the result are these beautiful landscapes these 
beautiful like scenes of a small town that I literally wish I could just like Alice in Wonderland tumble into and go live in it. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but when I do look at that art, it keeps me motivated. It reminds me that I should make my art out of pure love of doing it. And, and it also kind of just relaxes me, if that makes sense. It does. And it's funny looking at it and then hearing what you're saying. It's, it explains a lot. And, you know, what we've talked about, it's like, it actually does explain a lot because it is that the art for art's sake, highfalutin way of doing it. But then, well, no, but I know how to do it. And it's not right. about how to do it. Right. It, and it's also like, you know, I believe in art tradition. I believe in the importance of understanding art tradition and history. And, and to see him use his professional or his higher educational skills to honor that tradition, that folk art tradition. I mean, that's how you make steel. It's, you know, good art can be an alloy. You know, you can take two things and melt it together and hammer it into shape if you really work at it, you know, so... I don't know. I just love it. it. And it doesn't fit. Everybody's like, there's this tattooed dude who listens to a lot of death metal, but his favorite artist is this guy who does these grandma paintings. Like, I'm like, sorry, it's true. So there you have it. Some great advice and a great story. And I hope you took some notes because if you've ever dreamed about a career in art and design, more and more art and design career opportunities are on the rise and employers are on the hunt for the next generation of talented and of course skilled creative professionals. Here at Academy of Art University, you will get those work-ready skills that employers want. You can study on-site in downtown San Francisco, and of course, anywhere in the world with our online programs. To request info about our 40 plus areas of study in art and design, including game development, industrial design, illustration, and fine art, just visit our website at academyart.edu slash creative mind. My name is Bobby Brill. Thanks for listening.